Hi, this is Pastor Randy Shannon, and I'm glad that you're joining me for this message today. Our final message in our series on James and his practical wisdom for imperfect Christians is the power of praying for one another. Today's memory verse, the memory verse for this week, is from James chapter 5, verse 16. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Say that with me, if you will. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. It comes from our text for today, which is from James chapter 5, verses 13 to 16, where James writes, Is any one among you in trouble? Let them pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. May the Lord bless you as you read his word. Today, we complete our journey through the book of James and our discussion of the advice that James who was the half-brother of Jesus, we believe, gave for Christian living to imperfect Christians like us. That word imperfect might be troublesome to some of us, maybe to most of us, because the fact is, although none of us would claim to be perfect, we have become accustomed to trying to hide our imperfections from others. Apparently, this behavior is nothing new. The people in the early church must have dealt with it too. And that's why James issued the words in our memory verse today. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. We've all done things that we know we shouldn't have done. And just as bad, we have not done those things we know we should have done. We've had sins of commission and sins of omission. We're guilty of both. Paul writes to the Romans in his letter, Romans chapter 3, verse 23, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And you might recall that the Greek word translated as sin is harmartia, which literally means to miss the mark. We all have missed the mark. James invites us to live in an authentic Christian community that is characterized by grace, to be the people God is calling us to be. And that means we need to confess our sins to each other and pray for each other. And James declares that prayer is powerful. It changes us and it changes those around us. James gives us a blueprint in today's text for what the church should be like. First of all, we see that the church should be a singing church. He says, is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Paul writes the church in Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 18 to 20, Be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we realize the depth of God's mercy and grace, joy wells up within us and we sing songs of praise. An authentic church is a singing church. James also says that an authentic church is a healing church. Is anyone among you sick, he says? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well, and the Lord will raise them up. Justin Martyr lived in around A.D. 162 or so. He was one of the early church fathers and philosophers, and he wrote that countless numbers of demon-possessed people were healed by Christians in the first century. People, he said, that other exorcists had been helpless to cure and for whom no drugs had ever been effective. From the very earliest days, the church cared for the sick among them. In fact, early records show that it was customary for a community of faith to appoint at least one widow to care for the women who were sick. The parish nurse idea was one of the earliest ideas of the Christian church because it was a healing church. As Bible scholar William Barclay put it, the church has always cared for the sick, and in her there has always resided the gift of healing. Caring for those in need is not something added on to Christianity later. It's the very essence of the Christian faith and life. 
And finally, James says that an authentic church is a praying church. Is anyone among you in trouble, he says, let them pray. The prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well, and the Lord will raise them up. And if they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. James was writing to Jewish Christians and those who had been raised in the Christian or in the Jewish faith, and then they converted to Christianity. In this passage, there are several basic ideas of the Jewish religion. First is the idea that sickness is connected to sin. James, speaking of the sick, says, If they have sinned, they will be forgiven when they are prayed over. Rabbis in that time taught there is no suffering without sin. In other words, sin is what causes suffering. It's believed in their mind that healing would only come after forgiveness. That explains Jesus' words to the paralyzed man who was lowered through the roof of the house where he was preaching in Mark chapter 2, verse 5. He says to him, Son, your sins are forgiven. Certainly it's true that we can almost be paralyzed by guilt sometimes. And the first thing we need in those situations is forgiveness. It may be that the message that the paralyzed man needed to hear was a message of forgiveness that day. Or it may be that the crowd who witnessed that healing needed to know that Jesus had the power to forgive sins. But generally, we don't see all sickness as a result of sin today. And that's not just a modern thing. Jesus taught us that. He even made it clear in his teachings. He says in Luke chapter 13, Do you think that these Galileans whose blood Pilate mingled with their sacrifices were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you no, he said. Do you think those 18 who died when the Tower of Siloam fell on them were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you no. So Jesus taught that sin is not necessarily because, or suffering is not necessarily because of sin. Sickness is not necessarily because of sin. Yet even though we don't blame sickness on sin, it's still true that nobody can know any real health of soul or mind or body until they are right with God. A second idea that's common into Jewish thinking, besides the fact that sin was related to sickness, and sickness was related to sin, a second idea was the confession of sin must be made to others, especially to the person wronged, as well as to God. The pastor at my daughter's church, Reverend Wendy Krostek, tells the story of the days when she was a server at a restaurant before she started her seminary training. One day a man came in who was clearly in a bad mood and having a bad day. Nothing she did to try to improve things made it any better. Instead, her cheerful service seemed to make things worse. When he paid his bill, not only did he not leave a tip, but he wrote a hateful note about her on the ticket. She was crushed and inconsolable and driven to tears. A day or so later, the man came back into the restaurant and, and sought her out. And I'm sure she thought, oh, great, here he goes again. But he explained that he had been a jerk to her, that he was having a really bad day the day before and had taken it out on her and that that was not the kind of person he wanted to be. He confessed his sin, in other words. He apologized and said she didn't deserve that kind of treatment. And he gave her a $20 bill and then he left. And that's a good example of what confession looks like, confessing our sins, especially to the ones we've wronged, and seeking to make things right. And it leads to healing in our spirit, and in not only for the person who, who made the wrong, who needs to be healed, but for the person who was wronged, they need that healing as well. In sin, there are two barriers that are erected, one between us and our fellow man, and one between us and God. And both require confession to re remove those barriers. William Barclay reports that early Methodists met two or three times a week to confess their faults to one another and to pray for one another that they might be healed. The revival we talked about in another message uh, some weeks ago that occurred this year at the Methodist-based Asbury University in Wilmore, Kentucky. You might have remembered thousands of people descended on that town when they heard about it. As I understand, this revival began from a time of confession and prayer, just like that. Of course, we must use wisdom in choosing what to confess and to whom, or we might do more damage than good. For example, one time a young woman confessed to my mother that she was sorry for the hateful thoughts she had harbored about my mom, 
Mom had been aware of those thoughts until that time, and the confession, although it might have made the girl feel better, actually was more hurtful than helpful to my mom. The fact is, we need to be right with God, though, and with one another. So use discernment in confessing your sins and making things right with people and with, one, and with God as well. A final thing we learn from James's thoughts on the community of faith is that there is no limit to the power of prayer. Prayer puts us in contact with the power of God. It's a channel through which we can receive strength and grace. I've heard many people testify to the difference prayer made in their lives, and I can tell you personally the difference it makes when you know someone is praying for you. My grandmother prayed for her children and grandchildren every morning, and I got a glimpse into those prayers when my aunt recorded her one day. The Bible gives evidence for the power of prayer in Acts chapter 4, verse 23 to 24, when Peter and John had been arrested for preaching and healing in the name of Jesus. And Luke writes, on their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them, including, don't ever preach in his name again. And when they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. And verse 31 says, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Acts chapter 4. After they prayed, the place was shaken and they were filled with God's Spirit and they spoke the word boldly. Later in Acts chapter 12, Luke reports it was about this time that King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. And he had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. And when he saw that this met with approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the festival of unleavened bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four guards, or four squads of four guards each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying for God to help him praying to God for him. That's in Acts chapter 12, verses 1 to 5. The church was praying for him. During the night, an angel came and woke Peter up and led him out of the prison to safety. Then the angel left him, and Peter, who thought he'd been dreaming, suddenly realized it wasn't a dream. And he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many people had gathered and were praying. Notice that the people were praying for God to deliver Peter. In the middle of the night, they were urgent in their prayers. They were fervent and and faithful in their prayers. And God answered their prayers. There's power in praying for one another. Something I've learned through my own experience is that prayer is more powerful when you let others know that you are praying for them and when they know that you really are doing it. You're not just saying you're in my thoughts and prayers. I've learned that people need to know that that they have your undivided attention and that you're available to them in their time of need. If possible, pray for them in their presence. Don't wait, until you, don't wait until later if you don't have to. If you're on the phone, pray for them there on the phone. And if you say that you're going to pray in a post on social media, do it right then. Don't put it off or you might forget it. And finally, remember a couple weeks ago our memory verse was, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. It's the same with prayer. Prayer accompanied by action is the most powerful Invite God to work in you and through you. If there's something that you can do to be an answer to another person's prayer, an answer to their need, then do it. And remember, confess your sins to each other. Be right with one another and with God. And pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, help us to be the church you intend us to be, a place of worship and singing, a place place for healing the broken and the brokenhearted, a place where we lift one another up with our prayers and our encouragement. May we be known for our mercy, our love, and our grace. And may Christ be honored and glorified in all we do, for it is in his name that we pray. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.